So I'm going to just give some very quick introductory remarks about what this topic is, and I'm going to talk really fast because um, my panelists have a lot more to say that's important. So we, we just want to look uh, in this panel at a sort of a specific example of how economic analysis currently figures in agency proceedings. And we're going to talk about an ongoing FCC proceeding in particular regarding enterprise data services, which used to be known as special access. It's now referred to as business data services. And it includes everything from dedicated business lines to, uh, to resold uh, business lines, and also importantly, cellular backhaul. And when I say ongoing, I mean ongoing. Um, this current proceeding is now over 10 years old, uh, with the FCC going sort of back and forth on how much to regulate this market and how. Uh, after some years of dormancy, uh, the proceeding picked up again in 2012 with the suspension of certain pricing flexibility rules that had been in place for a while and then a collection of sort of vast uh, new data on the state of the market uh, as of 2013. And this market, just to give you a sense, uh, in 2015 is estimated to be about $45 uh, billion. So uh, not a retail market, so many uh, sort of, you know, consumers don't see it, but a very important part of the broadband ecosystem. And like other parts of this ecosystem, uh, BDS is uh, in the process of converting from sort of a, an analog world to a digital world. Uh, once dominated by uh, the sort of uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the regulated uh, exchange carriers, uh, it's now seen the rise of new technologies and new entrants, particularly in cable, fiber, Ethernet. Uh, and I think one thing that everybody agrees about about BDS is that its future is, is, is going to be uh, IP-based. Um, in May of this year, the FCC issued a further notice of proposed rulemaking in this proceeding. Uh, calling for a new regime that would that could apply price cap regulation on not only old entrants but also new entrants, uh, and this was based on sort of novel new ideas or definitions about meanings of words like competition, dominant providing, and an assessment of market power uh, that many economists who have weighed in on the proceeding, including my panelists, uh, have severely questioned. Uh, uh, the further notice insisted, quote, that technologies change but basic economic principles do not, unquote. Uh, but the question we want to address is whether or not basic economic principles are in fact being applied in this proceedings. And though I'm going to act today strictly as a moderator, uh, I should uh, say in all fairness that in my own filing on the sort of legal and policy implications uh, of this proceeding, I did quote uh, Nobel Prize winning economist Ronald Coase, who famously said, if you torture the data long enough, nature will always confess. Um, but let's hear the, the economists who have actually looked at this proceeding see it differently. Let me just briefly introduce them, uh, going from uh, left to right, uh, my left to right, uh, my panelists are uh, George Ford, who's the chief economist of the Phoenix Center, uh, Jim Prieger, who's a professor of economics and public policy at Pepperdine University School of Public Policy, and then last but not least, Mary Schwartz, who's a professor of economics here at Georgetown University. So George, I'm going to start with you. Um, uh, just sort of overall and very briefly, uh, what do you see as the main weaknesses in terms of how basic economic principles have been applied in this uh, proceeding uh, from, from the work that you've done in particular? Well, it's an interesting proceeding because it looks like there's a lot of economics being done, a lot of filings, um, a lot of economists involved, some very good economists, um, critical of the whole proceeding, but not necessarily of the uh, people that are working in it, there's funda a fundamental problem that goes back, way back, uh, a paper I wrote years ago on market definition. And the market definition the FCC uses, the market definition proposed by those that seek regulation, is that the geographic market for special access is location or customer specific. This is standard strategy. Right, in an antitrust case, which is where the FCC gets its analysis because it's only been around 80 years, can't come up with its own. Um, it, um, you define the market first. The parties merging want big markets. That makes them look small. The parties that are challenging the merger or want regulation want small markets because that makes the party look big. That's how it works. But there's a problem when you make it too small. Because now you got one buyer. And if you've got one buyer and one seller, you're in what we'd call a bilateral transaction or a bilateral monopoly. 
and there's nothing to gain from regulation. Nothing at all. Okay? They're producing. They're getting the competitive outcome. Okay, you can think about first-degree price discrimination. Okay? What you learn when you learn first-degree price discrimination in principles of economics is that the problem is not monopoly. The problem is a monopoly charging a uniform price. <coughs> the uniform price causes the welfare loss, not the monopoly itself. The monopoly can price discriminate, charge an individual price to every customer, and the welfare loss goes away. There is no deadweight loss anymore. What the FCC's market definition does is say, I'm going to let this monop pretend this monopolist negotiates with every customer individually, which means there's no welfare consequence of monopoly. Okay, that's the first thing. This is a market definition question. There's no economics being done because they define a market and never track it through. The second problem is, it's been brought up a little bit um, by me and, and to some extent the other parties, is the issue of the competitive market test or, or running these regressions on the number of competitors in price, which is completely bogus. It makes absolutely no sense, economics, and I've explained why, and any basic economics lesson would teach you that. Market structure is endogenous. The price of a duopoly market is not the price in a monopoly market. The price in, with three firms is not the right price for two firms. You can't transfer one over to the other. We've got pretty much free entry in this market, except for the fixed cost involved in entering. Okay, so you have a constraint on industry structure, and nobody's talking about that. And you've got these simple least squares regressions that, these, that the guys are running, and they're making arguments that make no economic sense. We have to allow entry to be endogenous. There's a reason there's a monopoly. There's a reason there's a duopoly. There's a reason there are three firms. These aren't historical accidents or numbers you look up in a book. Okay, these are economic outcomes and equilibrium, no different than the equilibrium for price. And the FCC's got to start thinking that way or it's just going to make ridiculous decisions like it's doing right now. So uh, let me bring in uh, Jim and, and Marius as well. Um, let me ask you both uh, one at a time. What, what are your thoughts about this proceeding and how it's looked at this concept of, of market power in particular? That's not what I was going to look at. I have some bigger picture points. I'll talk yeah. some more if they don't want to. <laughs> Before we address that, can I first just give my thoughts on some of the main weaknesses? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, I want to start by saying, so I, I spent a year at the FCC. Um, they have good economists there. The problem, you know, the famous quote about, I don't know where Tim Brennan is, but the economics free zone is not a comment by him or anyone else about the quality of the economists at the FCC. And any criticisms that I make of economic analysis as it is listened to at the FCC is not a comment on either the chief economist or any of the permanent staff there. Um, but I did identify three of the main weaknesses, I think, that um, are typified in this proceeding. The main, well, the first one um, is just that there is too much of a zero-sum mentality evinced in some of the writings coming from the FCC, there's this notion that you can take a dollar from a supplier by squeezing prices down, grant it to some other party, the buyer, and that there's no net welfare loss or gain there. Um, and that's, that comes up in many um, kind of subtle ways in the language that the FCC uses. There's a lot of talk about balancing various interests. And, you, and as soon as you start talking about balancing interests, you're talking about redistributing redistributing parts of a pie. There's you know, this notion that, well, you can take a little bit from one side, and it just makes the other side tip down, but there's the same amount of weight. It's just where you're putting it. And that just completely ignores the fact that there are welfare costs to setting prices too low, to distorting investment incentives, and so on, that we can talk about later. Um, there's also talk about windfall profits. I mean, as if you know, a hurricane comes in and let a telecom company get excess profit instead of recognizing that, well, no, that's a return on an investment that was made. Um, the second weakness that I saw is that I think there's far too much, um, we call it ex post opportunism, on display towards existing infrastructure, kind of this notion of, well, they already built it, now we can exploit it by forcing prices down. And I can say more about that later as well. The final thing is that <coughs> it, I was glad to hear um, you know, our friend from OIRA talk about the push for cost-benefit analysis. Now, it will 
be interesting to see if the FCC is ever forced to take this seriously, because I don't think they've ever done it, at least not that I'm aware of in any serious attempt. Usually, or, or too often, it just seems that the benefits are assumed. You know, it take anything, BDS or broadband or some regulatory change. The benefits are assumed and the costs are ignored. And it's, it's, you kind of are in this advocacy space where a lot gets said and very little gets measured or a, or a serious attempt put into measuring what some of the longer run costs might be. It was very heartening to hear already today much emphasis on impacts on incentives and preserving those because part of any serious cost to run benefit, certainly in this industry, has to incorporate longer run notion of costs not just what you're talking about today, but what this infrastructure might be used for in the, in the future. And if you've priced it out of existence, well, then you're not going to get that innovation in the future. So. Eric, did you, want to, did you want to weigh in just the general weaknesses, and then I'll come to you for the specific question as well? Yeah, I mean, let, let me first a disclosure, which is always a good idea in this town, right? Um, this is, I filed on behalf of the American Cable Association a paper <coughs> co-authored with Dr. Federico Mini. Uh, so I may not be entirely unbiased, quote. But that said, um, I agree with a lot of what, what was said, uh, especially by Jim, which is that um, th there's in insufficient attention to the costs of regulation, and that permeates a lot of what's going on in the proceeding. Um, and there's a serious risk of what I'm going to call regulation mission creep. And so let me expand on that a bit. Uh, the FCC started with a fairly narrow problem, which is that uh, proxies it was using to measure when it's okay to forbear from regulating the uh, incumbent lex, uh, those pro proxies were not working very well. Those proxies were supposed to measure the extent of competition, and they basically looked at, at the level of a, an MSA, how much co-location is there in the central offices of the ILEX by competitors. And those proxies apparently did not work well for two reasons. On the one hand, uh, <coughs> co-locators did not subsequently build their own loops. And on the other hand, so competition was overstated. On the other hand, competition was understated because folks that built entirely their own facilities, the cable companies, were not included. Okay. So those proxies are bad, all right. That says, you, it's fair to, to, to then say, let's look at this industry to get a better picture of where is their competition, what difference competition makes, and so on. So they put out the data request, they analyze it. Um, the problem is that uh, from this fairly narrow problem, there's a real threat that it's going to morph into something bigger in two ways. Expand regulation to include new providers, the entrance point that was made. And secondly, prolong regulation way too long on the incumbent legs. Uh, so briefly, one, take these one at a time. On the issue of expansion, the notice for the first time raises the possibility of, well, maybe we should regulate more than just the incumbent. Okay. Um, and in that same paragraph, they say, and if we do, who's it going to be and how we're going to do it? There's nine questions in one paragraph. You can imagine what's going to happen when you go down that road. In terms of prolonging it, they propose this competitive market test that's going to determine when they can forbear from regulation or certain kind of regulation versus not. And there's hints that that competitive market test may be too stringent. Like if you, in terms of, well, do we have at least four providers or five providers, whatever the number. If it's too stringent, you're, then you're not going to regulate. You're going to be stuck for, for a long time. So at the big picture level, I'm really worried that, before getting into some of the details, that starting from this small problem, we're embarking on the path of more expansive regulation, longer term regu regulation, and so on, which is very costly in general, as we know. Um, and once you impose regulation, it's very hard to modify it or to take it back. Okay. That's one reason, by the way, when I was at the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, we, they used to have consent decrees, which is court enforced orders that fix a certain problem. And they used to be open ended. The problem is the marketplace changes. You try to get rid of the consent decree, you have to go to court. Somebody intervenes, and it's a nightmare. So what the Department of Justice has done is actually put term-limited, 10-year ten, term-limited decrees precisely to recognize that we don't want to be regulating or sort of interfering with conduct forever. Uh, so that's a big risk I see in this proceeding, is that it started off with a small problem, and it's going to threaten to blow up and go on forever. And you've, uh, you've also written, Maris, in, in your paper that, that 
there's a difference between applying this competitive market test uh, to incumbents versus new entrants, and that in particular applying it to new entrants is, is sort of, I don't want to put words in your mouth that you didn't use, but <laughs> unprecedented and dangerous. Uh, can you say a little about that? Yeah, so, so there's talk of market power, and, and let's, you know, without defining exactly what it is, let's just drill down a little bit. Um, if you step back and say, how does the FCC and other sophisticated regulators, how do they uh, approach the transition from monopoly to competition, which is kind of what we're trying to do? And basically, there's the so-called dominant, non-dominant paradigm that's been followed, and what does that involve? We start off with a, a monopolist that's priced regulated. That monopolist could either be a franchise monopolist in the U.S. like the ILEX, or it could be a formerly government firm like British Telecom that was privatized. Okay? And they're price regulated because they were the only game in town, they were a monopoly. Now we're going to bring in competition. So in the Telecom Act, we eliminated monopoly franchises. And the notion is, as competition develops, we're going to deregulate the incumbent. That's the paradigm that's followed virtually everywhere. Now, um, no, in this setup, we don't regulate the entrance. Okay? The issue is, when do we deregulate the incumbent, not not should we regulate the entrants. And there's very good reasons for that. The most obvious one is you want to provide incentives for the entrants to get in. We've mentioned incentives before, I guess. Uh, it's very important. Um, and you want to avoid burdening them with regulation, with the cost of complying and thinking about regulation, when the whole point of the exercise is to eventually get rid of regulation by moving to competition. Now, when you then superimpose in this structure and you say, well, what happens if an entrance sometimes has market power? Maybe there's an area where the cable company was the only one that decided to build facilities. The incumbent didn't, either because they didn't think about it or because of disincentives caused by price regulation itself. Whatever the reason, if the cable company builds a facility, is the only game in town, and is deemed as having market power, should we then regulate it? If you follow antitrust principles, which is what the commission says it's wanting to do, move towards competition, under antitrust law, we don't regulate the prices of somebody, even a monopolist, if they became a monopolist on the merits. If they got there through investment or skill force at an industry is the buzzword, fine, power to you. And that's, that principle is reaffirmed the Trinco decision in 2004. And that's to provide incentives. So in our context, I find it really ironic that one of the, the F, there's a passage in the notice that says one of the, the great success story, entry success story, has been cable. And they saw all the great things cable done. And I said, oh, by the way, uh, maybe we should regulate them. <laughs> so let me just pause there. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. Um, and so, Jim, let's talk about another version of this. This is from, from your filing has to do with rural uh, BDS in, in particular. Um, you make the case, I thought, quite persuasively that this is uh, a very different kind of market. Uh, and, and, and again, the idea of applying price cap regulation here uh, might be even more dangerous than, than in general. Can you, can you sort of give us an overview of that first? And I'll have some more follow-up question on that. Sure. Um, so when I was taking a look at what's going on in the rural markets, um, I really basically came to the conclusion that the FCC just really seemed to have a, what I called a blind spot regarding regulation and innovation, a regulation and investment that will have, I think, its most important consequences in those rural markets. Um, let me just unpack that a little bit. First of all, it was interesting in the, N the FN FNPRM, <laughs> the further notice of proposed rulemaking, um, how few times incentives are actually, and incentives to invest are actually discussed in the FNPRM, and every time they are, it's about some hypothetical competitor, not the incumbents. And so there's just, that's why I call it a blind spot. It's just assumed that infrastructure by the incumbents will continue to exist, will continue to be there, and will continue somehow magically to appear in the future. We don't have to think about it as regulators. Um, Researching this, I found others that had estimated that up to one-fifth of ILEC revenue is plowed back into maintaining just existing facilities, which means it's not just there for free. Yeah. So th there's a question of 
um, expanding infrastructure, which requires massive new investment, but also a lot of investment is just to you know keep trading water with what you have. And so you, it is in that sense, it is not innocuous or without consequences to take away potential revenue um, in places where infrastructure already exists. Um, I do some calculations in the paper. I won't run through those here. Anyone who's interested has already read it, and the rest of you don't care. Um, but you can come up with large estimates of how much revenue might be taken away if various forms of these uh, price regulatory proposals are put into place. Let me just say that the, um, you know, the dollar signs are in billions, not millions here. And um, that just is going to translate into less incentive to maintain and expand in those areas that are just teetering on the edge of profitability to begin with. And these are the rural areas. So that was my um, point of interest there. No one else is interested in those areas except the incumbents because of the characteristics of low demand and so forth. And remember, we don't have in the BDS marketplace, there is no, um, what do you call it, obligation. There is no carrier of last resort obligation that an AT&T or a CenturyLink or some other ILEC has to continue to provide a T1 line, right? Many ideas. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I didn't say that. But so these things, it, it, they're not just automatically going to continue to exist if it's uneconomic for them to be provided. And so there's a real um, potential there. But also let's think about, okay, so that's old technology, you know, a T1 line. We've had that for decades. Um, and yes, they are still in use in many of these rural areas. Eventually, of course, we would like to see, and we will switch to packet-based technology, IP technology, um, but what have you done, for example, for the incentives for new providers to come in and deploy that technology when now they face an incumbent who is forced through regulation to offer below market rates for the service? Like, well, why would you enter that sort of a market? That's the kind of market that you stay away from. Um, so this is kind of like, you know, subsidizing buggy whips and horses. And uh, yes, that would delay the... Um, deployment of automobiles in those areas. Um, so I think that blind spot just really showed up in a lots, of, lots of places. And I, I do think, you know, and, and these are exactly the areas that we care about if we are worried about universal service for something like 5G. It is in the rural areas. You know, saying that you have a, a theoretical, hypothetical discount on wired backhaul for your rural 5G is great, but what if the service isn't there <laughs> for you to get the discount on it? I mean, that's really what we need to be thinking about here. So, if I, so I think we understand what you're saying is that, that price cap regulation in the rural area may actually lead to not only less investment, even possibly withdrawal of service. That's obviously not the outcome anybody wants, uh, including the people advocating for it. What's the economic principles, what, 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 what's missing from the analysis that this is not coming up as the potential risk? What, what should they be doing differently that they would see it and, run, and understand that the, the risk here is, in fact, making things worse rather than making things better? Right. Um, I mean, the only thing that I can mention is I think it just goes back to that zero-sum mentality. I, I just think they're not thinking about it. I mean, search for the word incentive in things that the FCC writes, or search for the word investment, and it's just never in the context that we're talking about here. And even if, you know, you come to other conclusions, that part of the story is just not in the mix right now. So, I mean, what the, what the FNPRM says is, what, you know, the, the goal that the FCC at least has stated is that they're trying to come up with a, a technology-neutral uh, in fact, a sort of single approach to regulating this market that would apply to everybody. Um, and I think the issue that you've all raised in different contexts is this idea of, of who has market power uh, and therefore who would need to be regulated and whether or not it needs to be by price cap regulation or something else, but who needs to be regulated. My sense is that, that what they're doing is equating uh, the number of competitors or high concentration under HHI or whatever measure, uh, that equals market power. Uh, and I guess my question is, what? And, and my sense is none of you think that's a particularly effective way of measuring market power, at least as an endpoint. So what would be a better way uh, to measure market power if you were going to decide, yes, we need to regulate if there's, uh, if, if there's a problem, 
how would they measure it to find out if there's a problem better? Let me start with you, George. Thanks. I just released a paper last week, week four last, on this very topic. Uh, went in great detail about how you would do that. I think it's, you say you look up investment and innovation, look up market power and see if you can find a definition of market power in the NPRM. There's not one. There's no definition. The FCC never defines what market power is. Okay? They rely on the affidavit of Reisman, which says market power exists when competition lowers prices. So if you observe a duopoly price that's lower than a monopoly price, then that means there's market power. There's no economic basis for that. Okay, you can have a monopoly with zero profit. You can have a duopoly with zero profit. You can have three firms with zero profit. There's no market power in any of it. But that's the way the FCC has defined market power. I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's I'm a small mind among big minds, but I can't get past these little pieces that don't make any sense. Before we get to questions about innovation and investment, which the FCC will just assume are positively impacted by its ever-brilliant policies, which it always does, and cite some piece of crap study that supports it, right, like it does in all its network neutrality orders, okay? Let's ask a very simple question. Is demand curve sloping downward here? You know, those kinds of questions. Is there a demand curve? We have a lot of these papers, there's been two of them I've responded to, where they measure the benefits of, of this policy of reducing prices by 50%. Okay? I mean, there's, most of this stuff is regulated still, and they think we've got we to gotta reduce price. What the hell have you been doing? Right? You regulate this stuff already. We can't even find good evidence that when you deregulate it, price goes up, which means whatever the heck you've been doing is pretty much what happens when you don't do it. Okay? I can't get past these simple questions. You, have a you don't have a demand curve for special access under the FCC's definition of special access. You can't estimate a demand curve if there's one customer buying one thing. There's one deal to make. There's no lowering price and getting consumer surplus and all this stuff, you know. 300, 400% more circuits by cutting price. I mean, who's buying all that? It's just insanity at the, at the most basic levels. Okay, and I like talking about innovation and investment. I've kind of gotten tired of it because nobody pays any attention. Okay, because it's always positive, of course. Um, but look at the basics, okay? And the basics about market power in this business. Market power exists in telecommunications because it is a low marginal cost, high fixed cost business when price exceeds average cost by a big chunk. Okay? And it's got to be so big and regulation effective enough to shrink it. Okay? This is the just and reasonable standard of the Communications Act. You can't charge a price, you can't force a price below cost, you can't have too creamy a return. Okay? There's a band. And this fits perfectly into the standard economic analysis of market power. Okay? Let's get the price inside the band of the zone of reasonableness. And you've got to have a regulation that can do it, but the first thing you've got to do is demonstrate the price is outside the zone of reasonableness. And these silly regressions they're running does not do that. And it's got nothing to do with robust standard errors or clustered standard errors. It's got nothing to do with any of that. It's just silly from the beginning. It's fundamentally flawed. This is not the proper analysis. We are effectively assuming demand curve slope upward. I mean, not in, a, not in the re real sense, but that's about the same assumption that we're making here. It's the same wrongness, degree of error, is to do something like that. And that's not, you know, unprecedented in telecom, if you remember the Berkman study on, on, um, on bundling and, and uh, broadband. Jim, I mean, do you have any thoughts about a better way to, to, to measure when there's a case for regulation, when there is market power that, that... Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I've been a little distressed to see is that some of the lessons I thought we'd learned about the role of potential competition in industrial organization back when I was in graduate school in the 90s, um, still willfully or otherwise appear to be ignored in um, an agency like the FCC, and so you still have or you know, some agency players submitting proposals that basically say, well, you know, only, you're only, you only count in capital N, the number of participants in this market for which we will talk about market power if you are actually offering service in that market. Well, of course, that's usually one in this context, but I mean, we've learned so much in IO and 
I mean, even in the world of broadband specific research, Scott Savage has papers on this. I've done some work on this. The role of potential competition really does matter, both for spurring introduction of new services and bringing down prices. Um, even in this proceeding, um, Glenn Warwick, Mark Israel, and some others had some very nice empirical work where they took a careful look at, you know, well, how close would you have to be given characteristics of networks to be considered a potential competitor? And, crunched all the data, and it just, I mean, these approaches seem very sensible and natural to those of us who are economists, but I guess because they don't lead you to the answer that there's no competition, they, they, they get ignored. Um, I mean, that's, that's the biggest improvement and an easy one, I think, that can be made just in measuring this question of market power. It's just you know, who's, who's participating in the market in terms of having an influence on the outcome is a much larger set of players than the people you see actually providing service to that customer. And, and Marius, in, in your filing, you talked about experience in other markets outside the US, how they handled this question of, of market power in terms of new entrants. Uh, what can we learn from sort of non-US experience here? Obviously, obviously, the starting point is very <clears throat> different, which you might want to mention, but. Yeah. I mean, as, as, far as, as far as we know, we took a look. Um, as of April 2016, in, in Europe, all except three countries did not have regulation of business data services, um, the exceptions being, you would say, we're the three, Belgium, Greece, and Lithuania. So you're welcome to join that club if you want. Um, and then, uh, to our knowledge, entrants were never subject to price regulation. So um, particularly instructive examples, uh, Ofcom in the UK in 2016, uh, they refrained from regulating the cable company, which was the main competitor to British Telecom in business data services, that's Virgin Media, even in cases where Virgin Media had very high market shares, essentially tracking the logic of the antitrust approach. If you're going to have competition and let the guys make investment without the guaranteed monopoly franchise, then don't regulate them after, uh, after the fact. But let me cycle back a bit to this issue of market power and... and you know, I don't want to go into how you measure market power, but I, I will agree that there's too much attention on ex post after the fact price cost margins. You know, and then you know you, you can look at drugs and say a successful drug, huge margin on it, but how many of those didn't succeed? You know, maybe telecom investment isn't as risky, but in some of these cases it may be quite risky. And so to look at after the fact margin is probably not a great criterion, except in a fairly narrow. Uh, area like you have the incumbents, they have their corporate infrastructure, you know, at what point can we free their regulation, free them from price regulation? The big, uh, when, when I mentioned at the beginning that one of the risks I saw is this pro proceeding prolonging regulation, um, this goes back to what you mean by competitive and non-competitive. Now, as John Mayer beautifully told us, <laughs> we, we in, or the FCC, nor the FCC don't have a, a clean answer to this, and nor, nor a single answer. But it is very important because uh, there's a real risk that if competitive is going to be construed as perfectly competitive, or, you know, super hyper competitive, and before we get there, we don't deregulate. And that's a real danger. At times, the F FCC has used effectively competitive to mean much less than that. I always like to give it the char charitable interpretation of it's competitive enough that we're better off relying on competition instead of regulation. And I think that's the right way to think about it. With that standard, um, you don't want to insist on three, four competitors. One, because you may never, never have it. Two, because even two robust competitors may be far better than regulation. You got Airbus and Boeing are competing. Nobody's saying there's only two of them. Let's regulate them. Um, and the um, the point about two competitors, to Jim's issue, potential competition in this market is actually quite real, because even if the person doesn't have facilities right there, if they're close enough, I don't know what close enough is, I haven't looked at it, but if they're close enough, it's a, it is a market where you sign contracts. So buyers can sign a contract, we're getting five years, build to our location. That says that even a provider that's not quite there yet in that narrow geography may still be an effective threat. So to me, the, the notion of market power boils down to do the customers have effective choice? That's, and you know, how you operationalize that is a complicated matter, but that's, that should be the concept, not counting competitors. On that last point of counting competitors, if you look at uh, Mark Riesman's regressions, which 
uh, George and others have done. Suppose you, you grant everything in those regressions, which is never mind why there are more competitors in one place than another. Is that really exogenous? Suppose it's true. Suppose you believe that we have the right experiment. More competitors seems to lower the price that the incumbent is charging. Right? That those are the regressions. One, it doesn't lower by much, right? And um, so two, that effect doesn't exist, apparently, for higher bandwidths, above 50 megs. In fact, for higher bandwidths, the, the FCC, there's a, a section in, in, the no, in the notice that's called uh, Evidence of Market Power in the Delivery of DS1 and DS3 Services, that's TDM Legacy, and Lack Thereof for Higher Bandwidth Services. That's the title of the of the sector. Well, if you take that seriously, then one, why are we thinking of regulating higher bandwidth? Which two, competition is, is increasing, not decreasing, especially with demand growth, which opens up the room for more competitors. And it gets back to the question of, from a fairly narrow issue of, you know, when do we deregulate the incumbents, DS1 and DS3s, um, which were built under the the you know, copper infrastructure paid for largely under the old monopoly regime. But when do we deregulate that? We're now moving to a path where, gee, let's have the, 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 the new regulatory paradigm going forward, technological neutrality, blah, 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 everybody's in there. And let's expand regulation. Let's potentially extend it forever by requiring four competitors. I'm really worried about that. You, got, you have to be realistic about the cost of regulation if you have two robust competitors, that's probably a good idea to deregulate them. Let me just stop there. Okay. And, and so obviously the way that this market was moving until recent years was in the direction of deregulation. And we said, as we agreed, there were, there were sort of under and over uh, uh, reporting of, of competition. Now, at least the proposed rulemaking would apply a, a, a price regulation to, to everybody if there's market power. And we already described the weaknesses there. But um, what I don't see in the, in the proposal now is anything about sort of the cost of that choice of remedy. So I wonder if you could all comment on that. In other words, uh, there are alternate ways, assuming all these things were the case, that there were these weaknesses and there, there is market power, um, is price regulation the best, the most efficient, the only way to, to solve problems if, in fact, we concede for the moment that those problems exist? Um, do you want to start, George? Um, yeah, I mean, I, the the consequence could be, of course, a re reduction in in the growth of competition. For one, if you set the price low enough, um, if you set the price say a little bit below a monopoly price in the market, which or below the duopoly price in a in a presently monopoly market, you may deter entry as demand rises um, a little bit or costs go down a little bit. Um, and this just goes back to the point of, of entry being an, an endogenous thing, which, it, which is what I'm saying is different from potential competition, which is more of, I think, a static concept um, or a single game, single stage game concept. The assumption is free entry, which is, has a very powerful meaning to it. Um, I, I think that that's a big deal, and I talk about that in my paper. You could deter entry, and I think uh, going to Jim's uh, work, yeah, I mean, this is going to hit rural markets. Um, the tendency of regulation is to average over huge swaths of, of, of geography. And when you do that, you make things in high-cost markets or low-demand markets look bad uh, for, for investment. And it, under uh, no un obligation to provide, then deals that could potentially happen can't happen. And that's a huge welfare loss, and Jim's absolutely correct. There's nothing to gain from regulating special access under the definition of consumer-specific markets. There's nothing to gain, okay? But there's a lot to lose. Any action, by definition, reduces welfare under that market definition. And one of the consequences is, is, is taking high-cost areas and, 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 and prohibiting deals that would have occurred at a higher price. So, Jim, what, what about that? If, 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 if Price regulation has this particularly potentially devastating impact in rural areas. What would be a better approach, if at all, or, or, or is the approach to, to, to do nothing? Yeah, I mean, you always have, I mean, I always try to emphasize this to my students. It's always easy with economic theory to come up with a theory that shows that there's 
some market imperfection or some market failure or some way that you can theoretically lead to better outcomes. But then you have to ask the practical question of will a regulatory scheme with all the imperfections and all the politics and all the non-economics and all the sand in the gears of how things get done, will that cure actually be better than the illness? I'm not convinced that it is. I mean, one thing conspicuous by its absence, at least as I look at the record, is for the folks complaining about the lack of tough price caps over the last 10 years, um, where's the evidence that that created any actual harm? I mean, don't give me a case study with a you know, sample size of one or some sob story about how you wish your price were lower. I mean, show you know, how it hindered the growth of 3G and 4G mobile wireless. I mean, I, I don't see it. And so I'm, I'm hesitant to suggest any alternative regulatory regime. I think the kind of de facto price cap, which was really kind of a rate freeze that we've had in place in some of these purportedly less competitive areas, seemed okay in the sense that the regulation probably you know, wasn't binding. So in a sense, it was kind of like it was unregulated perhaps even there. And I just, I don't see a convincing case that anyone's made that that was a bad thing. And so, uh, you know, the, the regulatory changes you might make, I mean, if you can identify barriers to entry, you know, whatever those might be, um, that might be a useful direction that regulation could take. If, if, but again, I mean, in these um, higher cost rural areas, for many of them, it's, it's hard to see that there will ever be much effective competition. I mean, unless somehow we invent something where you don't need all that wired infrastructure to actually offer the sorts of services that we want to offer. I just don't see those economies of scale going away. And, and Marius, I mean, do you see a, an alternative or a better or more efficient approach to regulating here than, than, than price caps or? Uh, I'm, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> I mean, for a, Price caps on the incumbent as a trans transition measure may well be as good as anything. Uh, the big point I want to mention is don't get into that mindset. I mean, of how do we get better regulation? Let's do it right for the 21st century and put every other tenth in technological neutrality. Just don't go there. Once you in, get in that business of asking how big is the margin? Is this guy paying too much? Is this guy to pay a little? Could we be better off with three or four or five competitors? If you put that test, you'd regulate the whole huge swaths of the economy, but we don't, right? So the way I see the world, good policy is you carve things into two. Certain markets, you've got a monopoly because of natural monopoly when it exists truly as opposed to made up or whatever reason, and then maybe you regulate it. In cases where you think it's possible to have competition, you just rely on competition, and that's kind of maybe simplistic, but that's the way I look at the world. Like the Cable Act of 92, you had a, the 50-15 rule where Congress said, stop regulating prices when you had one competitor that crossed half the market and had a 15% market share. I mean, it's like a HHI of 8,000. Um, but that's, that's what Congress said. That's when you deregulate. Regulation can't do better than half a competitor. Half a competitor. All right, so we're, we're really out of time. But let me just ask sort of one last question of, of each of you. Um, so obviously, the, the, we have this massive data collection. Uh, we have this very long record. If the FCC were to do proper economics, do you feel that they have the data they need in particular to decide how or what to do with BDS market, uh, or in fact, they still don't have what they need? Do you think they've got what they need? I don't think they have what they need, and I don't think they'll ever have what they need. They've been looking at this thing for 15 years, and, and the reason they haven't acted is because they can't get information they need to do what they want to do. And now they're just doing it out of sheer will. It doesn't have anything to do with the case. Um, I think that, and whatever they want to do, just do it right, you know? I mean, actually do some economic thinking on this and make sure you got your ducks in a row and collect data that really answers the question. And no, and they tried to get more data, granted, and they didn't get, they should have stopped when, the, when they told them they couldn't uh, get the data set they wanted. Um, but I think going forward, what they've got to do, and, and everything that they do, is we have got to start thinking about competition as a two-stage game where we have the number of competitors determined and prices determined. Because we keep, all we talk about now is promoting competition, but the FCC has no model of the number of firms that it talks about. It's just like just some random number. Let's make it five, six, seven, eight, as Marius was saying. No, that, that's never going to happen, ever. It's too expensive to be in this business. We had a question earlier about wireless. Can we even have four guys 
deploy 5G? Does it need to be three? I mean, there's obvious pressure in that industry to consolidate further. So we, we just, we have got to start thinking about the number of competitors being endogenous to the problem, okay? And, and understand why N is small, okay? And don't ask the DOJ, they can't count below four. <laughs> Jim and Marius, any, any, any last thoughts yourselves? Yeah, just briefly, it is very challenging with this whole issue of data. So, you know, these econometric studies that we're talking about, you know, it, it's, it's almost an exercise in economic history, how quickly the industry moves and we're analyzing data from several years ago. Now, how do you actually do that in more real time? I don't know. I don't think it takes two, three years between data to analysis. Um, so maybe things can be improved there. But then, of course, there are costs to data collection for industry and other ways. So I'm hesitant to say that we you know, mandate an ongoing data collection. That's not what I'm asking for either. So I, I don't know what to suggest there, but it is very difficult. But here's the thing. You do not... You have to keep in mind, you don't want to make forward-looking economic policy based on backward-looking econometric analysis. Marius? I'll leave it there. All right, good. Well, then I'll <laughs> leave it there, too. I want to uh, thank my panelists very much, and uh, please join me in thanking them. Thank you. Thank you.